I'm going to hand it over to Sean Tracy, who's our technical content director, and Simon Vickers, um, who is a senior designer in Planet 42. And we're going to sort of open up the curtain a little bit. They're going to get in the editor, and they're going to sort of zip you around the planet we built for this, which will be a planet that will be in Star Citizen eventually. It's just not the Stanton system. And uh, so I can kind of show you some features behind it, and then uh, there'll be a deeper dive done by the German office. Uh, so I'll, I'll hand you over a short trade. And I have to say that they, that last thing was the first time I've ever seen it any time we've done that playthrough. But that's live demos for you. Um, so Sean, over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Hey, everyone. How's it going? All right. So yeah, you, know, you guys know I get excited about this stuff all the time. So. They thought they'd put a mic in front of me, and actually, like, usually I write down bullet points of what to say. I actually have bullet points of what not to say, so that's going to be good stuff. So I wanted to show you some behind the scenes. Um, they want to see your screen up there. Very good. All right. So what you're seeing in front of you, um, uh, myself and Simon uh, work in this uh, every day. Is this is the space box editor. Uh, this is what our developers use to build our build our systems, build the planets. Uh, pretty much anything that goes in the game runs through the editor. So you might recognize Port Olisar, but uh, what you probably haven't seen before is the planet that's sitting there underneath. So one of the big things that we had to do with the CryEngine, and I get asked this a lot of times, like, what did we change from the CryEngine? Did we just take that and start plopping models into it or whatnot? Not at all. Um, the terrain system had to be completely rewritten. So one of the biggest things that it needed to support, of course, was spherical terrain, like you're seeing up there. Uh, one of the other things it had to do was go up to a planetary scale. Now, the CryEngine terrain system was actually really good in the first place, but it was designed for you know, uh, uh, a flat eight kilometer sort of area. Uh, and not a true planet. So one of the other things is all this stuff is runtime generation. So all of it is happening in real time right in front of you. You saw we had the frame counter up in the uh, top right for the entire demo there. And that's something that uh, you know any engineer, uh, any artist, anybody working on the demo can really be proud of because that frame rates of that um, uh, level are, are, are hard to get when you're trying to do content to this fidelity. So one of the other things that you saw was the seamless transition from space to first person ground. Um, I, I haven't seen any other project or any other uh, uh, game, to that matter, um, that has the sheer uh, um, range of scale that we have. So when you get really up close on the first-person terrain, it looks like you're down on the, on the terrain. It's not blotchy. It's not too big. You don't get all screwed up with the, uh, with the scale. All right, so the next thing um, is that there's no restriction to view distance. You saw this in the whole pull through in the uh, initial demo, but you'll see this here as Simon zooms around within the editor. And again, this is all happening real time. We thought it best to show how we actually build this stuff for you guys so that you guys can have a little bit of faith that we're going to be able to fill um, all this content up for you. So one of the things we like to do is just kind of show the scale, because the scale is really hard to wrap your mind around. Um, as, even, as a, even as a designer, it, it can be uh, um, very jarring when you go from just a centimeter level of precision all the way out to thousands and thousands of kilometers. So he plopped a character in there just to give you an idea of what you're actually looking at, because it can be easy to get um, um, sort of a, a god complex when you're looking at this kind of stuff. All right, so I think we're going to go find a little area here and uh, do a little bit of work because one of the biggest uh, and most powerful pieces of the tools, and it's probably what we work on the hardest, is that it, it's, it's artist guided, but it's procedurally generated. So the artist can still have this really fine-tuned control over the areas that they want, but we can do it on such a massive scale, and they can even go in afterwards and sort of tweak up the objects. So you'll see he's actually just creating more landscape. Um, we actually use an ecosystem system, an ecosystem technology to do this. So I'm going to let Simon paint a little bit of terrain here. And this is pretty awesome. This is what we get to do every day. So um, it's really exciting to be able to work on this kind of technology. And it's even better to be able to stand in front uh, of you guys in front of this kind of technology because there's 360 other you know, developers that are working on this stuff. So um, got to say that it's a massive, massive team effort. All right, so what he's actually doing is painting down different ecosystems. Uh, the ecosystem is kind of like a high-level visual representation of a classic level, uh, of a classic 
game level, really. Um, so the ecosystem defines things like uh, g the general terrain shape. Um, so whether it's down desert, whether it's mountains, whether it's ocean. Um, it also defines some of the main feature terrains, um, things like uh, erosion or valleys and trees. And you can see as he paints around, it changes all the ecosystem underneath. All right, shall we find a nice little spot to build up on? So while Simon looks for a little spot here, just to let you know, the uh, planets are made out of uh, uh, all these ecosystem tiles or chunks, uh, and it's made out of thousands of these chunks, and we can modify them again on a really, really macro scale, so uh, on a planetary scale, uh, or on a very, very micro sort of scale. So the first thing he likes to drop down is always a, a little bit of a, a lake or a river. So of course we've got the water support that uh, we wanted to, but we had to actually rewrite the whole ocean and, and water volume system in the CryEngine to be able to support, again, this spherical level uh, uh, terrain. And as you can see, the results are actually really, really good. It's no pressure on Simon at all. <laughs> so what he's placing in now is one of these object containers. So again, we thought it'd be cool if we really just kind of pulled the, pulled the curtains and, and showed you how we, how we make this stuff. So an object container is uh, how we actually classify a whole bunch of different objects. So it might be lights, it might be geometry, uh, might even be script. Um, there's many different things that an object container can contain. Uh, and the whole point of object containers is really so that we have this powerful streaming system so that we can bring in an entire level worth of content and then bring it out. And even better, we can fly around levels of content, which is what the capital ships are really doing. So this is the tower we just saw in Homestead. We're going to set up a little uh, location here. We'll put a couple uh, objects down uh, and, and we'll do a little bit of exploring. So you see how quickly the designer actually controls uh, the procedural distribution of the trees, grass, groups of objects. And this isn't restricted to vegetation, right? You can do this with rocks. You can do this with uh, grass. You can do this with buildings, maybe, question mark. Uh, we'll get to that at some point, I'm sure. So one of the things I did promise my German counterparts is that we'd keep the tools off the screen uh, because they really want to reveal this stuff. They've done a ton of work on these tools. So a lot of uh, what you see, we get to showcase you know, the final results of this stuff, but there is so much work that actually goes into being able to bring you that, um, and a lot of those guys don't get enough credit. Um, so really excited to be able to stand in front of this stuff uh, for them. Yeah. Woohoo! So he's dressing up the scene a little bit. He's trying to make it a little bit nicer looking. Um, we've got a special little prop here that uh, Simon seems to like to drop in. You might recognize it. So we're creating a little home for this crab. I think he lives under the tower. Yeah. Maybe he's got a family. Yeah, it's a, da it's a daddy crab, you know. Yeah. <laughs> now we're talking, Simon. Now we're talking. So that gives you a really good idea of, you know, this took, what, maybe, you know, five, six minutes, um, and we were able to build up just a little section. Now, you know, this isn't about to ship out to you guys looking exactly like this, but uh, again, it shows, oh, I thought <laughs> he was mad. We, we would ship it, Simon, just. We would ship it. You would all play it, I'm sure. Um, so again, uh, we need to be able to create this content super quickly, but still have that artist input, because if you don't have that artist input, uh, eventually you end up with very generic looks, uh, and we can't give you these moments that we really are uh, 
um, are excited to, to, to share with you. So what do you think? Should we show that? Uh... All right, so the last little bit of this uh, is kind of a fun bit is uh, uh, in a lot of game levels, the thing is, is that you're in a skybox. Like, it, it, what you're not, what is so hard to wrap your head around is that that's not a skybox, that's actual atmosphere scattering that's happening. The sky is blue because the light scatters, right? Um, so let's just kind of prove that to you. Um, those little sprites in the sky, they're not really sprites, those are other planets. So let's see if we can explore one of those. One of the other cool things, anyways, just about our editor in general, you saw that while he's developing, he can actually just jump in and start actually playing the game directly from it. Um, it's a super powerful tool. Uh, you won't iterate too much on stuff if you have to shut down, take five minutes to reload some other, uh, uh, some other uh, executable, then you come back to your editor. Being able to just minutely change thing after thing after thing and jump in and try it again and jump in and try it again and jump in and try it again, try it again um, gives you really polished content. So there's one reason I'm standing here talking about it and Simon's flying. He's actually, he's a very, very good pilot and I think we're about to showcase this, no pressure. So that's not a sprite. Let's go. All right. So a little bit of a different looking planet here. So this is kind of showing off a little more of the exotic ecosystem that we can do and we barely just scratched the surface on how far we can really take the, uh, the exotic bits. These are sulfur lakes. This place probably just stinks. I mean, it's super hot. The sunset though that you can see again with the atmosphere scattering, we get this for free. Um, you know, not for free. I mean, somebody worked very, very hard on it, Carson Wenzel. Um, but in terms of actually running in the game, when the sun comes down on the horizon, yeah, we're going to get that scattering. We get natural day-night cycles because, well, the planet's rotating. So you see they're doing a bit of mining here, but uh, Simon's, he's brave. All right. <laughs> oh, he almost blacked out. We're all done. There's no pressure. But we really wanted to show you again, like, without having too big of a demo put around it, we wanted to show you how we kind of, uh, you know, level design jazz, Simon called it earlier, just something a little bit improv. And oh, what's this? That's somebody, somebody's flying information with us. Let's wrap this up. Yeah, there was no So we're gonna go chase him down, see where he went. So it's an interesting ship there. All right, so we've given away way too much